So why should a secular Buddhist care what the Buddha would think? This is a question that's good to consider. We'll consider it coming up right after this. Hey folks, so I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. And if you're new to the channel and interested in helping to promote a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled world, consider subscribing to the channel. So Crispin Bennett had this question uh, quite a while ago, and it was one that, that I thought was worth actually doing a video on. Why should a secular Buddhist care what the Buddha would say or would think? After all, the Buddha is just another guy, you know, just like all of us, so why consider him as special? Why take the time to research and understand what he had to say? And of course, there are two standpoints here we can take. One is, I would say, a more religious one, and one is a more secular one. Uh, in a more religious uh, standpoint, we want to say in some sense that we come to the Buddha with faith. That is, if he said it, it must be true. That's the kind of uh, faith-based approach that one finds uh, with religious believers. Uh, and of course, there's going to be a, a wide range of w religious believ believers of this kind uh, within uh, particularly Western uh, th uh, theistic circles. You have more of the idea of uh, faith without reason or blind faith. That is to say, you accept you accept it simply because you accept it, and there's nothing more to be said. And of course, in that circumstance, it becomes extremely important to know precisely what somebody said. If there's any question or if there's any problem with the transmission of that oral information, well, you might be believing the wrong thing. But of course, on a, on a different part of that uh, uh, line there, we might say that there's somebody who uh, accepts most of it on confidence, uh, particularly, let's say, uh, they'll say that they have confidence in the Buddha's teachings about certain things, they believe he's a wise man, and so therefore they accept, let's say, uh, all the stuff he says about uh, being able to have certain kinds of supernatural abilities, like being able to fly through the air or something. Now from a secular point of view, uh, we're of course much more towards uh, one end of this, uh, or maybe even off of this kind of line altogether. What we're going to say is uh, that he is clearly a very, very wise and knowledgeable uh, person from the evidence that we have, but he's nevertheless, uh, we're going to say, probably an ordinary person. In particular, he's not perfect. We're going to take the same kind of, of general approach uh, to, to early Buddhism that, say, people in religious studies take towards uh, Jesus. That is to say, in religious studies, if you're studying the historical Jesus, you're going to leave aside the questions about the miracles. Uh, within a historical context, the question about uh, whether he really was raised from the dead, or whether he was raised from the dead on whatever it is, the third day or the fifth day, or whatever, you know, how exactly the story was true or not, that's not really going to be part of your aim in trying to figure out the historical Jesus. You're going to leave that to one side. That's a religious question, not a historical question. And in the same way, I think, as, as secular uh, believers, as people who approach the material from a secular perspective, we're going to leave uh, questions of the miraculous issues to one side. They're not the sort of things uh, that we can evaluate because we simply don't have the evidence for them. And, and literary evidence is not strong enough uh, on its own to, to establish those things as, as true. So we'll say the Buddha was smart and wise, uh, but not perfect, in the same way that we would, let's say, approach Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, who was the originator of, of virtue ethics, many p people believe was the, the Western ethical position closest to the Buddha's. That is to say that the point of ethics was to find the best sort of life, and the best sort of life was by increasing certain kinds of human virtues. And so we may say that Aristotle was similarly a wise and an intelligent man. Nevertheless, clearly believed a lot of false things. He believed, uh, for example, that the heart was the seat of reason and that the brain existed to uh, cool the blood. He believed he was very much a misogynist. He also uh, very much believed in natural slavery. So Aristotle had a lot of false beliefs by our, by our lights. One does not have to accept those views in order to consider oneself, at least in the philosoph modern philosophical context, an Aristotelian. Indeed, there are many uh, believers in modern virtue ethics who might describe themselves as Aristotelian without believing all of those things. Similarly, Isaac Newton was perhaps uh, arguably the most uh, intelligent uh, man who ever lived. He developed calculus in a very short period of time in his 20s, as I recall, really invented modern physics and yet spent his later life on strange uh, biblical interpretations. 
And we don't have to accept the biblical interpretations in order to understand that, that Newton had some very, very profound things to say about physics and mathematics. So past people had their failings. Indeed, all people have their failings. And this is one of the issues I discussed uh, with when I discussed uh, uh, gurus who have problems in a prior video. We're setting ourselves up for difficulty if we're allowing ourselves to be led down a garden path by somebody because they're charismatic or because they're apparently wise or because they're apparently knowledgeable. Even very wise and very charismatic and very knowledgeable people can be wrong in certain areas. And so when we're approaching the idea of a teacher or of a, a wise person from the past or a wise person right now, we have to always be willing to keep, you know, a skeptical eye open because wisdom is the kind of thing that we can share with people even from the distant past. In other words, wisdom, the, the, the possession of wisdom, does not require any kind of technical knowledge. It does not require scientific knowledge. Uh, a person living in a cave 5,000 or 6,000 or 10,000 years ago could be just as wise as anyone living today. Uh, without having any of the scientific knowledge, without knowing anything about modern science or modern physics or the way the brain works. Wisdom involves a skillful approach to life uh, and bringing oneself and others into the best sort of life they can achieve within their context. Now Crispin Bennett also brought up a very important, I think, a dichotomy uh, between what he called cognitive openness and commitment to a school. So for example, uh, we may say that, some, that a person is cognitively open if they don't identify themselves with any particular school, if they don't call themselves Buddhists or Aristotelians or Newtonians or whatever. And to the extent that you do call yourself one of those things, to the extent that you identify yourself with some school, you're sort of making yourself a cognitively closed to that regard. You're closing yourself off from other opportunities. And I think this is a very good point. Uh, we have to be aware, first of all, uh, of over-identifying ourselves or identifying ourselves at all with anything, really. That's always a problem, <laughs> even for, I mean, you know, ironically for Buddhism. I mean, identification is always an issue. And so we have to be aware that insofar as we are identifying ourselves with a school or, or claiming commitment to a particular school or approach or practice, that we also keep ourselves cognitively open to other, other alternatives or counter-arguments. So for example, this is one of the reasons why I've highlighted Stoicism on, on, these, uh, on these videos in the past, uh, because Stoicism is uh, one of several uh, schools of ancient Greece, which I think have a lot to, to teach, and in many ways have as much to teach as, as Buddhism. Uh, I think in certain respects uh, they are advances on Buddhism, in particular their notions of justice, and in some of their uh, philosophical arguments, their, their rational arguments are really quite good. In other respects, I think that they are a little bit limited, and I discussed those again in, in prior videos. And, and, and there are other schools as well, uh, not only Stoicism, but um, Epicureanism is another school of ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, Cynicism is another one, which the, the name is, is not really representative of the school. There are many schools within ancient Greek philosophy, uh, Arist I mean, Aristotle being another, uh, Socrates, Plato, all had very, very important things to say. I talk about Greek philosophy because it's extremely famous, uh, particularly within Western philosophy, probably the most famous ancient uh, school of philosophy in general. But of course, there are going to be uh, things like that around the world. Um, Confucianism in China, Taoism, so on. There are, are, are aspects of many, many of these uh, philosophies and religions around the world that I think bear understanding. Uh, even many of the statements uh, of Jesus are, are, are wise and good. So and everyone will find their own path, everyone will find those schools that resonate with them. And to the extent that, that we are eclectic and simply say that no one of them is, works for us, then we'll, we'll continue sampling here and there. And to the extent that we say, you know, you know this guy seems to have, have captured a good deal of what we find wise and true, we're going to stick with one thing. However, that's, I would say, one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in what the Buddhists said in the ancient texts, in the Nikayas in particular, is because I don't think that they're well enough understood in the West. Uh, when we talk about uh, Greek philosophy, Stoicism, uh, Epicureanism, uh, Cynicism, these are schools that are studied in philosophy programs, they're studied in literature programs, they're well known, there are many, many translations out there, they're easy to discover, there's a huge amount of secondary literature about them. 
But if you talk about early Buddhism, there's very little in the West, and in fact, less and less. I did a video recently about the problems of the study of early Buddhism and how they seem to be declining and decaying in many respects in the West. If we, if we compare what I, what I would say would be the in, intrinsic uh, wisdom and knowledge of, uh, that's reflected in these texts to their level of understanding and knowledge uh, within the West in, in a general sense, there's a huge imbalance. And this is one of the reasons I'm making these videos. Not because I believe that uh, everything is that the Buddha said was correct, neither that I think that the only place to find the correct things is Buddhism, but that there's enough of both of those and that they're uh, poorly enough understood that I think they bear somebody doing a few YouTube videos about. And in particular because the Buddha was very, very careful to outline a path of increasing uh, wisdom, a uh, kindness, and decreasing stress. I mean, this was his program. And, you know, and we can see it in many, many ways within these early texts, many different practices. So this, in a nutshell, is why I would say a secular Buddhist should be interested, or a secularist of any kind, should become a secular Buddhist, or why a secular Buddhist should be interested in what the Buddha had to say. Again, not to the exclusion of everything else. We should always leave ourselves cognitively open. We should always be interested in other wisdoms from around the world. But I think there's something special to be found in early Buddhism, and that's why I think it's worth getting it across. So, but I, I would very much be interested in, in your opinions about, uh, about um, Crispin Bennett's question, because I think it's a good one, and I'd be interested to see what you all had to say. So I hope that's been a useful discussion, uh, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video. So thanks a lot. Bye-bye.